people now, they want all this, this revelation. They want all this more. I want God to speak with me. I want, I want all these different things. And, so, and we're not even opening our Bible in the first place. So this is what I do. That's, I mean, that's exactly how I, I, I prepare a message. I want you to see God's word from beginning to end. That's why we teach through books of the Bible. I'm in a different kind of series now, but normally we just got out of Hosea. We're going to go into Hebrews. I teach that way, and I, I do this to train you to read the Bible like this. And so I don't possess anything special. I just have a little bit more training, but you have access to all kinds of stuff. My, my office is open to you. I have so many resources. If you come and say, well, I don't know much about the culture of, of you know, the Bible. I've got books for you. I've got tons of resources for you. Don't let your fear of not understanding scripture stop you from trying. Okay, that's all I had to say. Let's, let's go. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. We're going to read a big passage and I'm going to have you stand with me to give honor to the reading of God's word. Context, context, context. Luke 24, we're at the end of the book. So what has probably just happened? Crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Okay, we're going to pass the resurrection story, which makes me feel very uncomfortable it is the centerpiece of our theology, but I want to specifically see this, this incredible story that Luke is the only one who records it here. Uh, Luke 24, starting in verse 13, the resurrection has just happened literally that day. This is the Sunday of the resurrection. It says, now that same day, two of them, who's them? The disciples who followed Jesus, not his 12, not the apostles, or 11 at this point. It, it's just one of the, the many that were in the crowd following Jesus. Two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and together they were discussing everything that had taken place. What had taken place? Crucifixion, burial, resurrection. Well, they think the resurrection, they don't know yet, okay? Sneak peek. Spoiler alert, sorry. 15 says, and while they were discussing and arguing, you know that this is a church because they could not agree on uh, this matter. <laughs> Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. And then he asked them, what is this dispute that you're having with each other as you're walking? And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. And the one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? Man, I love this because if he would have known who he's talking to, definitely wouldn't have phrased it that way. And Jesus' response in verse 19, what does it say? What things? What things? Does he know? Obviously, it's him. What things, he asked them. So they said, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Oh, man, that is, that's giving me chills. Besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb, and when they didn't find his body, they came back and they reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was, what, alive. Some of them, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And he said to them, this is Jesus' response, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, here's the key verse to understanding all of this. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going farther. But they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it was as he reclined at the table with them, and he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then, verse 31, what happens? Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? And that very hour, they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, the Lord has been truly raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Man, this is a fantastic passage. I could spend several hours, but we're only going to spend two in, uh, in this passage. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on this. 
Father, we love you, Lord, and we love your word. I pray that it wouldn't just be just talk. Just, it, w- it wouldn't just be church talk. That we love your word, that we believe your word, that it's perfect, infallible, inspired, that it is a treasure. I pray that, Lord, those things are easy to say, but I pray that you'd help us to live them, to value it, to treasure it, to read it, to invest in it, to meditate on it. I pray that as the vibrancy of our spiritual life is dependent and will never surpass the intake that we have of of your word, I pray that our intake would increase, not to check off a list, but, Lord, to know you in a deeper way, to know you, love you, obey you, serve you, and rejoice in you, worship you. We love you, Lord, and we ask you to bless this time, bless the reading of your word, and help us to interpret this. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would uh, be our teacher this morning. Help us to understand what you have for us. In your name, we ask these things. Amen. Our church, you can be seated. So here's what I'm going to do. As quickly as it's possible for someone like me, and Johnny, I'm going to let you know already. Where are you? You're back there somewhere. Uh, Johnny Thomas, he gives me a mint every week before the service and says, you put that in your mouth, and when you're done with it, the sermon is over. Um, And it was done before the announcement, or before the welcome was over. So um, technically I have until he gives me another mint to uh, to keep going. But here's, the, here's what I, the question I want to address and answer in, in five different ways. What are some ways that we can approach Scripture without it seeming like we're checking off a list? Because I could really, I could just come to you and I could say, tomorrow, here's your reading list, Genesis 1 through 3, we're just going to do it and we're going to check off that list and we're going to keep going. I want more than that for us, church. I don't, I, we've got it in our heads, and, and please don't misunderstand me here, but we got it in our heads that we have to read through the entirety of Scripture every year. That's the reading plans they show us every year. Like, you got to read through all of it every year, okay? And if you're doing that, that's amazing, and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful for you and that intake of Scripture. But church, it's not about the amount that you're reading. It's about the, the intentional investment of your life into it. We're going to talk about this in Deuteronomy 6. It says, this word that, we've, that you've been given is to be in your heart. And it's easy to put it in our ears. It's easy to put it in our heads. I, as, as I've been running in the mornings, I've been listening to Scripture, and that on the surface sounds really good and really great and really holy, but there's many times at the end of the run, I come home and I say, I don't remember anything that I was listening to. And I've made it through like Leviticus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy and all these, and, and there's times like that. And so I want more for us than just checking off a list. Yep, I read it, I read it, I read it. Instead, I want to look and say, how do I know my Savior more through what I'm reading. So what are some ways we can approach scripture without it seeming like we're just checking off a list? Number one is this, make scripture a part of your everyday life. Make scripture a part of your everyday life. All right. Here's, here's the deal. I think this is, this is frequently what happens. One of the reasons Christians don't read their Bible as much that's been listed on, on different surveys and stuff is because we're too busy. We're just too busy. And so here's the things that I hear from Christians all the time. I, I want to read scripture more. I just have to find time for it. I have to squeeze it in. I have, to, I have to make time. I have to take my already busy schedule and I have to cram this extra thing into it. What is inevitably going to happen in that scenario, church? You're not going to do it. You're going to start it and, it, and it's going to fail. You're, you're going to start a reading plan and then in, as soon as Exodus is done, it's, it's going to go downhill. We're going to struggle with it like this. Instead of doing that, look what these disciples were doing here, okay? In verse 13, that same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. Do we know what they were on the way to Emmaus for? What was their task? What was, what was going on? Why were they headed there? We have no idea. This was just their life. They, they were traveling, okay? This, the, 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 we, we don't know why, but they were headed in their everyday life. This is a commonplace thing. It was a seven-mile journey. They could walk it in a few hours. They're going to get there, whatever they're going to do there, and then they're going to come back. This, this is a commonplace thing. What are they doing as they're walking? It says in verse 13, together they were discussing everything that had taken place. This is, this is one of the things I want, I want to look at it like this. Instead of shoving Scripture into the, the free moments of your life, 
like, okay, I've got five minutes here, I can, I can, I can do one chapter here, and, and over here I can add another chapter. Instead, why don't we infuse it into every part of our life? Take our life as it is lived now, and it's, you're going to be way more likely to be consistent when we look and say, how do I fit Scripture? How do I, how do I make this an intentional time of Scripture? We spend a lot of time just waiting in lines, church. We spend a lot of time just doing things like uh, driving to work every morning. Who has the longest commute? Lamar, I think you probably an hour, or uh, Matthew, where are you? You probably got, you're to Fort Worth, so you got, a, you got a while to go. So on that commute, that's a perfect time. How much time do you spend in the car line picking up your kids? Ages, I feel like years of your life in those car lines. Some car lines are better than others. Some are uh, intended to create moments of sanctification uh, because people don't follow the rules in, in some of those things. But we have time. We have time if we really think about it. We, it's not about squeezing something in. It's about taking our everyday life and making it about what the Lord is doing. These people were just walking from one city to another. And I want you to see in the midst of that really common activity, in the midst of a, a moment where they're just, they're, just, they're just walking, they're discussing who meets them on the road. Jesus meets them. And this is the key. He, he meets you in your everyday life. You, you don't have to segregate this time and say, well, well, in this time, I'm going to meet with Jesus. But over here, this is my other, my other part of life. There's, this is my work life, my home life, uh, my marriage life, my, my parenting life, and then there's my Jesus life over here. What he wants is all of it. So he meets them there on this road. In the midst of it, they, they were discussing what happened to Jesus. He meets them there in the midst of it and begins to talk to them. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 says this. These words that I'm teaching you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Listen, if the word, if, if what we're doing is trying to fit the word into our already busy life, we've got school, we've got work, we've got friends, we've got uh, you know, all this different time, and then we've got our time spent in Scripture it, it, we're going to be inconsistent. It's, it's what's going to happen. Something else will always be there to take priority and to pull our hearts away from it. But if it starts in our heart, if the word's planted into our heart, then everything that you do is an expression of, okay, let's meditate on scripture. Let's talk. Hey, we're picking my kids up in the car line. Let's talk. Hey, I read this verse this morning. What do you think about this? Let's, let's talk scripture. Make scripture a part of your everyday life. Second thing, I want to keep moving in this. Make peace with the fact that you won't understand everything. Make peace with the fact that you won't understand everything. These guys were obviously trained disciples. They knew so much. But look what it says in verse, where are we? In verse 15, while they were discussing and what? Mine says arguing. What does yours say? Talking, discussing, arguing. It was obvious that there was some discord here. There was something that they couldn't agree on. There was something that Jesus had to come and clarify in the midst of this. We've got to understand this as a church, that, that there's, we're not going to understand everything. And that's, and that's a good thing, church. So many people, this is the second biggest reason why people don't read Scripture consistently. And they say this, it's too difficult. It's too difficult. It's too mysterious. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It doesn't click for me. I, I don't get it. You, you walk in, and that's why it's so difficult to start in Genesis, because you get really into the stories and the drama of Genesis. There's some epic sweeping things that happen, uh, stories that happen in Exodus, and then you jump into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and that's where most people stop their Bible reading plans, because they say it's, it's just too difficult. And so what happens, instead of trying to, to understand it, instead of seeking out more resources or pursuing uh, more understanding of it, what do people do? They just stop. They just stop. And this is crazy to me that we're content with a relationship with God where we don't ever hear from him. Can you imagine not like being married and never talking to your wife? Like what, what, what kind of relationship would that look like? If, if like throughout the day I actively avoided Mindy because the things that she said to me were too difficult for me to understand. But like she, she'd be walking down the hall and I'm like, nope. Not doing this today. Can't do that. But we do with the Lord every morning. We wake up, oh, man, I just can't, I can't, I can't get Leviticus. I can't get Daniel. I can't get these things. And so we avoid it completely. And then what happens to our relationship with the Lord? Church, we have the same scripture, 66 books, 
1,189 chapters, 31,102 verses. And I want to give you a word of encouragement. You will never know it all. Okay? And that's a good thing. I will never know it all. And, and you, you, that may, you may look at that and say, well, but I want to know it all. We can't. That's the beauty of it. It is an ocean that will never run dry. It's a fountain that keeps flowing forever. It's, 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 it's a treasure that we will never even scratch the surface of. It's a buffet table that never runs out. It's a car that you can drive forever. The gasoline, the, the gas tank never runs out. It's a cell phone that never loses its battery. Whatever analogies you want to use, when we go to Scripture, it's new every day. Imagine an ocean of God's Word and knowledge, and every time we come to read it, we dip out a teaspoon. You think you're going to lower that by even an inch? No, and so it's, it's, this, it's amazing an idea that you could spend the rest of your life, you could earn doctorate degrees in theology, you could study his word 10 hours a day every day for the rest of your life, and you still will never learn all there is to learn, and that should be a comfort to you, because on this struggle, we're going to need more and more and more. On this struggle bus, man, we're going to need his word again and again and again until the day that we die. And the amazing thing about it is that Jesus meets us on our journey. He meets us on our journey. I told you this last week, but when you open scripture, the author speaks to you and meets you. It's a book like no other. When you, when you open scripture, when I open any other book, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just interpreting things. But here, when I open scripture, the Holy Spirit meets with us and, and he speaks to us through his word. He met these men as they walked along and they talked theology. They didn't see it then. They didn't recognize it. It says they were prevented from recognizing him, but they would later. Right? And that's the point. Sometimes we go through moments and we don't understand and we don't see what God is doing. We don't see his hand, but we look back later and we say, man, that was God. That was, that, was, that was God doing that and I didn't see it. That was Jesus meeting needs and I didn't know it at the moment, but he was walking with us the whole time. Make peace with the fact that you're not going to understand everything. It's okay. It's okay. Keep going forward. Keep being faithful. Third thing, make conversation about God's word common for you. Make conversation about God's word common for you. For you. What did Jesus do? How did he engage these men? He asked, he asked questions. So that's, that's it. Did he already know the answers to these questions? Absolutely. He already knew. Of course he knew. It was him. It was about him. They were discussing him. And, and he asked things like, oh, what are you discussing? And so then they stop and they're like, are you serious? You're the only one. You must be the only, you've been living under a rock. You're the only one who doesn't know the things that have happened in Jerusalem. And then I love his response in verse 19. What things? What things? So if he knew the answer, why did he ask the question? He is getting them from where they are to where they need to be. He's putting the pieces together for them. He's getting them to understand. And what he draws out of them is really impressive. What he draws from this people, in, in this, when, when Cleopas speaks to him here, in, from uh, verse 19 all the way through verse 24, what is he doing? He's sharing the gospel. He's telling the story of the gospel, of, of the, the perfect sinless life of Christ, the substitutionary atoning death of Christ, his burial and his bodily resurrection. He's, they're telling the story of the gospel. They don't even know it at this point. That's, that, that's, that, the, the, the beauty of this is that Jesus, when he meets them on the journey, he's connecting the pieces. He's bringing them together. But conversation about God's word has to be common. His goal wasn't adding to knowledge. It was for them to get to know him. To understand that he was the core of this. I want you to hear something real clear. The most impactful thing that you could ever do with your friends, your family, your coworkers, any, anybody around you, the most impactful, powerful thing that you could ever do is discuss scripture together. That's it. We, I'm going to talk to guys for a second. We can talk about anything. Like when you were a kid, what was the criteria of being friends with another guy? Yeah, you fight them. Yeah, you fight them and then become friends. Sometimes you don't need anything. Like, you don't need anything in common. You're just like, you live on my street? Okay, you're my new best friend, right? You have a ping pong table? Double best friend, right? We, 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 we will talk about anything. Guys, I, I, I have sat down with men in this room and talked about any number of things. We, we've talked football. I know y'all can sit and talk football. We, we can sit and talk it all day long. And I'm not attacking anyway, please understand. We, we can do it. We can, we can talk all day long. Uh, I just shout it out. What was the best year for Vandal football? Best Vandal football team ever. Okay, so you got it. You got it. We can talk about it all day. You can tell me who was on the team. You can tell me what, what, when they went to state. We know all these statistics. We have our favorite sports team. We can talk about it. We can talk about politics all day. Man, I, I, all, all we need is a conversation. Hey, did you see what... Biden said this week, you're like, oh no, what is it this time? We, we, we have this conversation, we can talk about this forever. 
We, we could talk about, uh, I mean, I can't personally, but I'm sure, Colt, you can, you can talk to me forever about cars and, and about fixing engines. And I'm like, you're literally speaking a different language, and I'm amazed that you understand how all these things happen, because I think it's magic. I think that's how it all works. We can. Uh, Reed, I've sat and talked to you forever about Marvel movies and uh, different superhero things and writing and different things. Like, we talk about things all the time. But do we bring Scripture into it? Could we have a discussion unbroken for an hour about what God has said in his word and what he's doing in your life right now? For many of us, I think we'd say, I don't know how I could. I don't know how I could do that. I don't know how I could come up with all that. Uh, there was one one pre- preacher who said we couldn't sit in a room for five minutes and, and list the things that we love about Jesus. Uh, it's it's scary, church. That we can we can talk about anything as guys specifically. We'll talk about anything and everything, but then when it comes to Jesus, it's like, oh, I don't know anything about that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not comfortable talking about that. If we're not going to talk about it in here and around another group of, of Christian guys. We're never going to talk about it in our daily lives. Make it part of your everyday life. Talk about Scripture constantly. I'm telling you, lead the way, guys. Go home. You're going to sit around at the lunch table today. You're going to be at Telly's. Talk about this passage. Open it up. Say, what do you think about this this verse? And then tomorrow, here's what you can do. Open up another verse and do it all again. You know, if, if you read one verse per day, okay, one verse per day, and discussed it with your family, it would take you 85 years to discuss every verse in the Bible. Now, some of them would be really interesting, the list of names and, and that kind of stuff, but it's a, it's a treasure of information for us if we would just invest in it. Fourth thing is this. Make Jesus the focus of your study of the Scriptures. Make Jesus the focus of your study of the Scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, from law to history to poetry to prophets to gospels to letters. It's all about him. From beginning to end, it's him. It's all him. And I think, again, one of the reasons why we struggle with Scripture, especially in difficult portions like Leviticus and and Numbers and some of these different places, is because we're looking at it with the wrong eye. We're looking at it with this eye to looking at every single detail rather than looking and saying, where is Jesus in the midst of this? If we would understand that the entire book of Leviticus is a lifting up of the truth that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. If we would look and say every single time that that lamb had to die in place of a person, that, that, that our hearts should be drawn and pulled toward the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb of God who was sacrificed in our place to atone for our sins. If we would understand it's all about him. Every verse shouts out his name. His fingerprint is on every single page. And so when we look at Scripture, look what he says. He comes to these guys, and and, and they they have all the right answers, but he comes to them and says, foolish, how foolish you are, how slow you are to believe the prophets, all that they have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning who? Himself. Himself in all of the scriptures. Now, their scriptures, in context, what scriptures was he talking about there? New Testament had not been written at this point, so he's talking about the Old Testament. They they commonly called it the law and the prophets, okay? But that includes everything that was in in the Old Testament. He's saying, it's all about me. If you would see that, I'm the focus of it all. And, And one day, church, we will see this. It's hard to see this now because we want to be the focus of everything. And we want to be the king that sits on our throne. But there's going to be one day, Philippians 2 says, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So for us as believers now, we say, right now, you are Lord. And all of my study of Scripture points me to Jesus. It all points me to Jesus. Pop quiz. What is Genesis? Let's go back to the very beginning. How does Genesis tell us the story of Jesus? Okay? Creation. He is the creator. He's the one who spoke all things into existence and sustains it by the power of his, or by the hand, with his hand of power. What else? Where, where do we see Jesus in Genesis? Say it. Yeah, yeah. He was promised in Genesis 3.15 that the, the, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Who is that talking about? It's Jesus. That's an overt prophecy. Where do we see him in shadows? So he's a couple of things. He or many things. He, he's the lamb that had to be slain to cover and clothe Adam and Eve in the garden. He, he's, he's the ark that righteous Noah fled to so that he could be saved from judgment. 
He is, he is the angel that, that met with Abram before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. He is the substitutionary ram that was killed in place of Isaac. He wrestled with Jacob. He, he is Joseph. The story of Joseph is the story of Christ, betrayed by his brothers, put down in the earth, and elevated to a position of glory. It's all about Jesus. So when you look at Scripture and you open up Scripture tomorrow, I want you to look and say, where is Jesus? Show me Jesus. I want to see Jesus in this passage. Make Jesus the focus of your study of Scripture. John calls him, John 1 calls him, uh, the Word made flesh. Hebrews 1 calls him, the prophet through whom God has spoken in these latter days. Matthew 5.17 calls him the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. It's all about him. Fifth thing, and I am finished. Make faithfulness your goal, not feelings. Make faithfulness your goal, not feelings. So Jesus spends that day expounding the scriptures to them. Man, Cole, I don't know about you, but I, I, I would give anything to be a, a fly on the, on the road listening to Jesus give a sermon about how all the Bible is about him. Man, they said their hearts were burning. I, I, I'd have been shouting hallelujah all the way down those seven miles to Emmaus. I don't think I could walk seven miles, but he's, he's expounding all this. He's saying it's all about me. He's teaching them in all the books. He's like, look, here I am in Genesis. Here I am in Exodus. Here I am in all of these books. And they get back and they eat dinner with him. And that's when it says he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. And how did they respond? They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to them? Church, there's moments like this in your Christian life that are incredible. You've experienced these moments where your heart just burns for the Lord, where you just feel his presence, and it's amazing. And you, you, you go out, and you're like, I'm, I'm going to go out and win this world for Christ. And I'm a, what is the old phrase? I'm going to charge hell with a squirt gun. I'm going to do all these things. But church, is this the norm? No. If you live like this 24-7, I think you're going to have some kind of embolism. I don't think you can survive that. I don't think that's what it is. The norm is not the mountaintop experiences because we live in the valley. So these people, they had this amazing, these two disciples had this amazing moment. They're just, their hearts were burning. It was just, we love the Lord. He's teaching us and we feel great about this. But what they do next, that's the measure of how they respond to this. Because what they could have done is seek that feeling again. Where is Jesus? He disappeared. Let's go find him. I want to find him again. I want, him to, I want to hear him again. I want to hear him speak again. I want to get that same feeling. And we see this all over the place. And again, I'm not trying to attack theology, but man, in charismatic circles, this, this, it's all about trying to find that, that next feeling. I want, I want to feel God's presence. I want to do this. But instead, look what they do. It says in verse 33, that very hour, they got up and look what they did, church. They walked back. They just got there. Seven miles, they walked back. Why? Where were they going? What does the end of the verse say? They found the 11 and those with them gathered together. This is what faithfulness looks like. Instead of chasing that feeling again, they went back and they gathered together with the saints and they discussed scripture together. And this, this, is, it. this is why church is so important. Okay? It's not meant to give you warm and fuzzies. It's not meant for you to go home just like, oh, I just feel so good, right? It's because we gather faithfully in obedience to God's word. Neglect, do not neglect the assembling of yourselves together. That's what the book of Hebrews says. So we're doing this, and this is a display of faithfulness. You don't always feel like doing the things that you know you should, right? Do you, do you, do you feel, sometimes, do you feel like waking up and going to, to work in the mornings? You always feel like, you're just like, mm, I just love it. I love working hard. Well, I mean, you should. It's what we're created for as, as, as uh, men specifically. But sometimes we don't feel like it. Do you always, do not answer this, but do you always feel like coming to church on Sundays? I said don't answer it. No, we don't always. Sometimes you get up and you're like, man, if I could just, if I could just have a day to myself. You ever hear, you ever say that? If I could just have a day. Just have a day to myself. Our whole lives are lived for ourselves. Come on. So we go and, and we look at it like that. Do you always feel like uh, with your, in your relationship with your spouse? Do you always feel like the day that you got married? Do you always just feel in love all the time? You're just like, mm, so blessed just all the time. No. Don't, also, don't, an, don't really don't answer any of these questions. I don't want you to get in the doghouse tonight. Feelings, feelings don't matter at all, church. I'll be honest with you. The, the world tells you follow your feelings, follow your heart. Do not do that. 
Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. It's, it's, it's a tragedy, it's a disaster, it's a danger to follow something so capricious and, and so whimsical. We, we, we follow our hearts and it's going to lead us to destruction. So instead of following feelings, rejoice in the feelings. God gave them to you for a reason. We feel joy, we feel pleasure, we feel sadness, we feel uh, grief, we feel all these things because it's the whole human experience. But you can't seek that, you can't chase those feelings. Instead, make faithfulness your goal. Gather with the saints. Come together with the church and say, you know what, I don't feel like it today, but I'm going to praise the, the name of the Lord because he's worthy of it whether I feel it or not. Not every moment of the Christian life is going to feel like a party. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's a struggle. The majority of the time, we're on that struggle bus. But it's good. Remember, the struggle is good. It means God is working in us. Recap. How, how, do, I, how do I approach Scripture in a way that doesn't make me feel like I'm checking off a, a list? Make Scripture a part of your everyday life. Don't, don't compartmentalize it into another piece. Make peace with the fact that you won't understand everything. It's okay. It's okay to grow and learn. Hopefully, next year, you're going to know more than you do this year. Hopefully, you're going to be further along on the journey. Prayerfully, you will know Jesus more and worship him uh, and, and obey him more, more faithfully. But make peace with the fact you're not going to understand everything. Make conversation about God's word common. Your family should hear you talking about the Bible. They hear you talking about everything else. But the Bible should be part of our main conversation. Make Jesus the focus of your study and make faithfulness your goal, not feelings. Church, I'm going I'm to ask our praise team to come up. We're going to sing a song of invitation and response. This morning, I'm not going to have a, a typical salvation invitation, but I will say this. Wherever you are, I'm not going to say, hey, commit to reading the Bible through by the end of the year. I'm, I'm just going to say this. If you, it, put your money where your mouth is, and, and I say that metaphorically. If you say you love the Bible, if you say it's God's word and it's inspired and it's, in, and it's, uh, and it's inerrant and you love God because of it, then spend time with him. Prove it. Spend time with him. Don't check off lists. Read one verse tomorrow. I don't care. But read something. Read something. Go to him in prayer. Have, build that relationship with him. Remember a couple of things. Faithful, not fast. Okay, We're, we're not on a, a sprint here. It's a marathon. You've got, you've got your entire life to grow, and it, and it will take that long to, to uh, grow. So faithful, not fast. We're going to ride this struggle bus till the day we die. Enjoy the ride, bumps and bruises and all. Second thing is this. Don't measure your growth against other people. Don't look around and be like, man, he was taking so many notes today. He must be a better Christian than me. Or that person, has, they're just, they, they pray better in public than me. I'm just, I'm just a failure in my Christian life. Stop measuring against other people. Keep your eyes on Jesus and keep walking forward. Praise 24-7. Cultivate thankfulness in good times and in the struggle. If you're here this morning and your relationship with the Lord is thriving and you've been reading scripture and you're just like, man, I just feel so alive in Christ today, God bless you. That's amazing. I rejoice with you. If you're sitting here this morning and it's like it was just all the energy that I had to get ready and be here and sit here and not burst into tears. If that's you this morning, listen, give thanks to God because what he's doing in you is greater than you can see right now. He's working on you. He's chiseling away from you what shouldn't be, and he's planting his seed in you. Cultivate thankfulness in good times and in struggle. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time that we have in your word. We thank you each week that we, we have that routine of uh, just coming before you and being faithful and gathering on the Lord's day and giving you praise and honor and glory. Uh, Lord, I, I, I wish we would meet every single day and give you praise. You're, you're worthy of every single second of time that we have left on this earth. You give us every breath. You make every heart beat. You are the, the cause and the sustainer of all things, and we give you praise as your creatures. We understand we are not king, that you are the king, you are sovereign, and you sit on a throne. And so we, first of all, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for a lackluster devotion to your word. I ask you to forgive me that I have approached your word sometimes flippantly. I have approached your word many times thinking I already have all the answers, and I pray that you would teach me that I am dust, but beloved dust, that you love us and you gave us your words so that we would know you. I pray all of us would come to you this morning and commit ourselves to you, not to check off a box, but to know you, to meet Jesus on the road and to have him teach all the things that we need for life and godliness. Father, forgive us 
Put in us a desire for your word. Help us to make war against our flesh. Help us to obey you. We are your servants, and so we give our lives into your hands. Lord, we know that any growth that happens is, is due to you and your work in us, and so we praise you in advance. We love you, we thank you, it's in your name.